Welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice. Through interviews, discussions, and music, your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your hosts, Peter Carter and Dr. Jennifer Donaldson. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. In our third episode, we'll be talking with Charles Cole, the director of the Scuola Cantorum of the London Oratory School. We'll discuss the amazing music program at the Brompton Oratory and Oratory School, learn more about the structure of a British choir school, and take an inside look at the role of sacred music in an authentically Catholic education. Charles Cole began his musical training as a chorister at Westminster Cathedral. He went on to win a major music scholarship to Ampleforth and organ scholarships at Exeter College of Oxford and Westminster Cathedral. He is Assistant Director of Music at Brompton Oratory, where he directs the London Oratory Junior Choir, which, in addition to its liturgical duties, provides the children's chorus for the Royal Ballet's productions at Covent Garden. In addition, he is Director of the Scola Cantorum of the London Oratory School, a choir of boys aged 8 through 18, which sings the Saturday evening Mass at Brompton Oratory, as well as concerts, tours, and recordings. He is a regular member of the faculty for the Church Music Association of America's annual colloquiums, specializing in Gregorian chant and choral direction. He regularly gives choral workshops for choirs in Jerusalem, Nazareth, and Bethlehem. In recent years, he has given organ recitals in St. Petersburg, at Notre Dame in Paris as part of the 850th anniversary year celebrations, at the Cathedral of the Madeline in Salt Lake City, and at St. Savior's Church in Jerusalem. Thanks so much for joining us today, Charles. Thank you very much for having me. So to start off, we'd like to know a little bit about um, your background and a system, a musical system that seems a little foreign to most Americans' understanding of what a church music program might look like or what a children's choir program might look like. The English choir school system is something that only exists in a few places here in the United States. For example, at the Episcopalian Church of St. Thomas on Fifth Avenue here in New York. And in the Catholic sphere, there are the St. Paul's Choir School for Boys, founded by Ted Marier in Boston at St. Paul's in Cambridge. And the Cathedral Choir School of the Madeline at Salt Lake City, which was is for both boys and girls and was founded by Monsignor Francis Mannion and Greg Glenn. Since many Americans might not know what a choir school is, for example, what its goals are, how a typical day runs, how it's different from a regular school, can you tell us a little bit about growing up as a boy chorister and then serving as organ scholar at Westminster Cathedral in London so that we can understand the experience a little bit better? For example, what was your audition like to get into the school and did you live at the school or how did the curriculum work there? For sure, yes, Westminster Cathedral is a, a really incredible and immersive experience for a boy um, of the age of seven, which is what I was when I went. Uh, and I did an audition which involved uh, playing the piano and singing a song which I'd had to prepare. And the song that I prepared was the hymn, Now the Green Blade Riseth. And then there were various ear tests. And they were I, I don't remember this because I was only seven, but uh, I, I believe it was to, to quite a high level and uh, quite quite sort of tough and challenging. And then, of course, one has to remember that a chorister is going to be doing a great deal more in their day than uh, your, your average schoolboys. So the English and maths and, and various other aspects of the academics were also tested because you've got to be able to cope with that too. So it was, it was a whole day um, of auditioning and testing uh, to get in. And, and the year that I applied, to be a chorister, there were 40 applicants, and I think five of us got places in, in the choir school. So it was quite sought after. Nowadays, unfortunately, the numbers are not quite like that because the real issue with Westminster Cathedral is that it's a boarding school, and it's quite a big thing for a mother to send her, her boy away to, to board at that age. Um, and it certainly was a difficult thing for my mother to do, but she herself being a professional musician knew the value of that education. Um, and as a Catholic, she particularly wanted me to experience being at Westminster Cathedral. So I'm, I'm really very glad that I, I did. 
Westminster Cathedral, as, you, as I say, is a boarding school. So you live on site, you live right over the shop and um, you're singing in Westminster Cathedral every day. The day begins or certainly did begin back in the 1980s when I was there um, with uh, practicing your one of your two instruments, the piano or, or another one, and then uh, breakfast and then a choir rehearsal of an hour and then the school day begins as normal. So you've done all of that music before you even sit in a classroom. Um, and you then go through the whole of a normal school day uh, ending at around four o'clock, at which point you then have uh, time to do some homework, then another rehearsal um, in the song school, followed by mass every day at 5.30 p.m. And then after mass, uh, which would last generally an hour, and that was a full sung mass with with the propers and a polyphonic setting um, of, of the mass, ordinary and with motets. After that, supper, and then uh, further practice on your second or sometimes third instruments as well, and then bed. So it was kind of a very full day. Um, and I was a chorister for six years. So you can imagine doing that, something like that every day and being exposed to the music that Westminster Cathedral Choir sings every day has a very profound and life-changing effect, um, uh, which, which is something that I've carried forward really in, in what I now do. That's quite intense. <laughs> it's very intense, yeah. Could you tell us a bit about the music program at the London Oratory where you work now and the ensembles that you direct there? Yes, of course. Well, first, I should make the distinction between the London Oratory Church and the London Oratory School, um, and I'm, I'm connected to both. Um, the London Oratory Church uh, itself uh, has three choirs. Um, I'm connected with all three of them, but two of them are particularly my domain, and they are the two children's choirs. Uh, there's the Oratory Junior Choir, uh, which is a, a choir for boys and girls, um, from aged eight to 16. And those children come from all over London. They're not uh, drawn from any particular school. Uh, and it's effectively, it's like a parish choir. Um, it's, a, it's an after school activity. So they have rehearsals two nights a week um, and they sing for a benediction service on a Tuesday evening and for the 10 o'clock mass in the oratory church on a Sunday morning. So that's one of the choirs. The, uh, the senior choir is the um, uh, adult professional choir, which sings for the 11 o'clock mass on Sundays and for the sort of major feasts and for Easter and Christmas. Um, and I'm assistant director of that. Uh, uh, the main director is uh, Patrick Russell. And then the third choir is the uh, Oratory Scholar, uh, or the full name being the Scholar Cantorum of the London Oratory School. And that is drawn from the Oratory School. So all of the boys... Um, uh, go to that school, they have their education there and their musical education there. Uh, and effectively, that's uh, a, a sort of choir school um, set up that, that we sort of alluded to earlier. So these boys in the London Oratory Scholar, they come from all over London. And this school is a state school, which I think equates to a, um, a public school in the United States. Um, right. Uh, so it's it's state funded. It's not a private school. The the boys don't pay fees, and because of that, it means that there's a wide uh, spectrum of, of boys from different backgrounds. And of course, being a Catholic school, uh, there's also a representation of a lot of different nationalities. We have a lot of boys um, with Italian heritage, people from uh, Poland, from Spain, from various European countries. Uh, but of course, the thing that they all share is that they are they are Catholic, um, and uh, they all they all come from the Greater London area. So, can you tell us what a typical day is like for your choristers um, in any way that it might be maybe a little bit different from your own experience? And also, how does that play into the structure of the whole week or the whole academic year? Like, what is what is the larger calendar picture of your boys and? Maybe like what's a, a, a typical rehearsal like with them? For sure. Well, the the difference between the chorister experience that, that I had at Westminster Cathedral and and what these boys at the oratory have is, is really the, the difference is that they don't board at the oratory. So um, they are all day boys. They, they all come into school um, every morning from their homes and they're not singing 
in the oratory church every day either. They have a slightly different routine. They do sing pretty much every day of the week, but um, it's a slightly different routine. So they come to school, they arrive um, in time for an eight o'clock rehearsal um, in the song school at um, at the oratory school, the song, song room, I should say. It's, it's really our rehearsal room. And they have an hour rehearsal there um, every morning of the week. On three of those mornings, um, they additionally sing for a school assembly uh, that follows immediately afterwards. Um, and then they go into their normal school day um, and they go through their usual academic programs, uh, learning all of their various different subjects. And they also have quite a lot of music in their school day as well. Um, and they then come back to me for, for rehearsals during the day, um, during their break times, uh, morning break and lunch break, and sometimes after school as well. And then uh, on a Saturday, uh, that's their main singing day when they sing uh, the evening mass at the Oratory Church, they arrive in time to rehearse an hour and a half before mass uh, at 6 p.m. And then uh, they sing the mass itself. So they have um, they have quite an intensive um, musical schedule in the school, as I say, because uh, they all have um, two instruments to learn as well as everything else that they're doing with me. So they're learning piano and one other instrument, and then they're also learning music theory. And then on top of all of that, their, their academic day, plus they're probably also playing in either a wind orchestra or a string orchestra, or maybe the symphonic orchestra in, in, in the school. So that's quite, a, uh, uh, quite an, an impact on their schedule. And they have to, of course, do that having struggled into school from wherever they live in London, um, dealing with London transportation issues, which are uh, not easy to deal with at all. Right. So um, when it comes to how the academic year interfaces with the liturgical year, presumably the boys are there singing for big feast days, even though other schools might be on a break. How does that work? It works in that if, if there's a major feast day while the boys are in school, they will sing for it. But uh, it does mean that they're not actually there to sing for things like Christmas and Easter uh, because they are away on holiday for those. Yeah. Um, in fact, we, we tend to have a very, very heavy schedule in the run up to Christmas, as, as probably every choir does in the world. Um, and the, the boys do sing across the Christmas period with, with various other things that they're involved with, for instance, singing uh, at the Royal Ballet for their production of the, the Nutcracker uh, and so forth, things like that. But uh, if, if a feast day is outside of term time, it's not something that they do. Um, if it's a, a major uh, holy day of obligation, during school time, the whole school will go to mass at the oratory church um, and the school will sing for it. Um, and that's quite an operation getting the whole school up there. Um, <laughs> we have, you see, the school is, is, is a choir of 55 boys, but they're a tiny percentage of the school. There are 1,400 uh, pupils at the London Oratory School. Um, and they, uh, they walk back from the church to school afterwards uh, through the streets um, which takes about 45 minutes um, after after their big school mass. Um, but it is a very important thing for the school um, that the liturgical um, uh, high days are obviously uh, sung properly by the, the scholar and, the, and the, the boys in the school all attend mass. Um, and equally, at these assemblies that I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the scholar will always sing a motet um, every morning for the school assembly, which takes place in the school chapel. And those motets equally are designed to reflect the liturgical seasons um, of the year or, or nearby feasts. Um, and it means that the all of the boys in the school are being exposed to the same music, which is, is largely centered on the, the polyphony of the Renaissance. Um, and they're hearing that before they get to work every day, which I think is a, a really crucial thing. And I think for any choir, I think for the day to begin with singing is is such a crucial thing. I, I think that having the boys come in to start singing at eight, I get them at their freshest point in the day. Um, and they're sometimes a bit grouchy about being in school that early, you know, but uh, we're all human. But but once they get going, that is just the best time of day to work with them. And so I would I would always say if anyone was was wondering how to structure a, a, a day for a chorister, 
that is something very much to bear in mind. You also have the Scola sing charity concerts and go on choir tours. Can you talk about that and comment on why you think that's important for the boys' experience and education? Yes, of course. Well, there, there are a few aspects there. So the, we, we sing concerts every, every term. So we do three big uh, concerts each term. The, the concert that's coming up this coming term is going to be a performance of the Christmas Oratorio uh, by J.S. Bach. And that's because I have a sort of parallel project alongside all of the Catholic repertoire, the polyphony and the Gregorian chant. Um, I'm also very keen that the boys all experience the big major works of Bach, the, the, the two passions, the B minor mass uh, and the Christmas oratorio and other works that they wouldn't necessarily get to sing in the context of the liturgy, uh, things like Verdi Vespers and so forth. So there's a, there's a sort of parallel concert program going on. Um, in terms of charitable work, the, the choir is, is very associated with Aid to the Church in Need, and we sing two services each year for them, um, one during Lent uh, and one uh, in the, in the run-up to Christmas as well, which is designed to uh, bring awareness of the, the suffering of Christians in the Middle East, particularly in uh, Syria and Iraq. Yeah, then, that's a beautiful thing. It is. It's very important because, you know, the, the, the hope that the boys can bring uh, to those people to, to make them aware that they are being thought of and prayed of is, is, is prayed, prayed for is, is a very important thing, I think. And then, of course, you mentioned touring. Touring is good for, for so many reasons because it means that we can we get to take the choir to places where the music that they sing actually comes from. Um, so it's a sort of a really important immersive experience in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, so you can go and visit the, the very buildings in which uh, composers, for instance, like Lobo in Spain, you know, Toledo Cathedral, where he worked, you can go and sing his music in that place. That's that's an immense value um, to, to the boys, and it's such a privilege for me to be able to take them to do things like that. It also, um, of course, it promotes this kind of music in places where it isn't being heard, and in fact, in, in Spain, it's quite rare to have children's choirs that sing uh, this kind of multi-voice polyphony. So it's nice for us to kind of go back there and, 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 and sing repertoire of that type. And, and other places as well, we've been to the United States, as, as, as I think you know, Peter, last uh, year, uh, we were there in October uh, on the mm -hmm. East Coast and sang in some really beautiful um, places St. Vincent Ferrer in New York was particularly right. stunning and um, and St. Patrick's Cathedral of, of course was was wonderful with its amazing acoustics uh, and the, uh, the the whole experience for the boys is is very much an educational one as well and getting them uh, to different places to see different places experience different things so the tours are very important we try to do yeah. one every year if we can it sounds like it'd be great fun for the boys to get to travel the world you know in addition to all of this, the Scola has a number of recording projects it's done in the past, including movie soundtracks, which is really cool because, you know, what choir program at a church or at a school related to a church does movie soundtracks? Um, most notably, they've sung for the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which I think blows a lot of people's minds, you know. <laughs> Could you talk about your recent recording project, yes. Sacred Treasures of England, and if you have any uh, projects that you might like to do in the future with the Scholar. Yes, of course. Well, yeah, the film work is, is, is always uh, very exciting for, for boys to be involved with. And we've done a few uh, things like that recently. Uh, I think the last thing that we did was a series uh, about um, Queen Victoria, which went out on television. And I think will, if it hasn't appeared in the States yet, it probably will do at some point. Um, Wow. That kind of work is it's always it's always exciting. It's a very different kind of singing uh, for the boys to do because they they're generally going into a, a very dry acoustic of a, of a of a recording studio somewhere in central London, and they're singing kind of to order um, various different sounds which they will then they will then use and and with electronic wizardry and all sorts um, turn into what they sort of need. But when we do our, our sort of house recordings, as it were, um, we're doing something very different. We're, we're recording on location. So going into a church and, and dealing with the acoustic in that church, 
and dealing with everything else that's around it. So the, the Sacred Treasures of England CD is in fact the first of a, a, a series of CDs, the next of which um, will come out at some point next year, and we, we look forward to announcing that. Um, but that was recorded uh, in, in a church in London. Uh, we had all sorts to deal with. There, it, there was the, the, the flight path of planes going into Heathrow, traffic <laughs> outside, trains right. around. Uh, uh, the building next door was being renovated. Uh, I, it, it was just extraordinary. And uh, during the Sacred Treasures of England, there was a colossal um, thunderstorm, um, which um, the, the thunder wasn't actually the problem. It was the rain, because the rain was actually pouring through the roof and through the chandeliers of this yes. church um, and spattering onto the floor, which has made a terrible sound, which we had to sort of deal with. You know, it's, it was we had everything thrown at us. I mean, it's, it's not like it's hard enough to record that kind of repertoire anyway when, when you know, you're, you're losing good takes because uh, there's, there's, there's kind of water pouring into the flood. like something <laughs> like that. But, uh, but it was, yeah, it's been fun. And then an, another little recording project that we did um, is, is part of an app called Universalis. I don't know if you know that app. Oh, um, right. I know. I think I downloaded it last year or something. Oh well, very good. Yeah. Well, if you if you've downloaded it, then you can you can find an in-app purchase, which I know you're immediately going to buy, Peter. Um, <laughs> which is the, uh, the the oratory scholar boys singing um, sung Compline, right. uh, which you can you can hear them sing. It, it sort of auto generates. It, it we we sang lots of sections of Compline, and it it automatically puts together uh, what Compline should be on any night of the week that you listen to it. It's, it's a very, very clever bit of wizardry. Very cool. It's very cool. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'd like to change gears just a little bit and talk about pedagogy. Um, because a lot of Americans use music methods, uh, like Kodai or ORF. Um, myself, I, and others use the Ward method, which was a comprehensive music education method developed by a Catholic convert in the 1920s for teaching sacred music and chant to children. And a lot of these uh, methods depend heavily on teaching solfege, you know, do, re, mi, et cetera. But that's mm -hmm. not the typical English way. How do you teach the boys to read music and do ear training with them? I, I get asked this question quite often. And in terms of, of these various different systems, I, I think that when I was a chorister, we used... Uh, the Kadai um, method, and we, we used uh, a, a little of it, not a lot, um, and we certainly used solfege. Um, but as you say, in England, it's not so widely used, and I'm not entirely sure why that is. Uh, that's not to say it's not used at all. I do occasionally use solfege. But I think part of the reason might be that some of these, um, these systems are set up for teaching singing alone, uh, whereas what I'm doing here at the oratory school is is relying very heavily on the instrumental learning that the boys are doing uh, by learning the piano or the violin or whatever other instruments it is that they learn. Um, so in a sense, some of that knowledge of of pitch and so forth is is being deferred across to uh, their instrumental teachers, but by no means entirely. I think part of it also is simply that you throw the boys into the choir and the probationers, the, the youngest boys, they spend their first year not really singing very much. Um, I don't let them sing in everything. I let them sing some things, uh, but they are sitting there absorbing everything uh, that the older boys are learning. And then gradually they start to sing and, and they become absorbed into the process. So it's not kind of spelt out to them necessarily exactly what they're uh, needed to do within the context of, of a full choir rehearsal. But what I do do is take out each year group uh, every week. They have a separate learning um, session with me, which we spend entirely on sight reading. Um, and we use uh, books that uh, you can get over here. I can't remember the name of them off the top of my head, but they are, uh, yes, I can, it's just come to my head. They're called Join the Dots. And they're very useful little books, uh, which contain lots of short melodies, each of which has uh, some kind of little challenge in it, maybe a rising sixth or, or a descending fourth or something that uh, to, the boys will then encounter and then understand how to sing and so forth. So that's sort of how we deal with, with the systems. But um, I'm not aware of, of 
uh, many choirs over here using specifically and entirely uh, the systems that, that you mentioned, like the Kadai or, or the Ward method. So in the bigger picture, um, this pedagogical experience is um, an intense one musically, but I, I'd like to get at a little bit the idea of music as a central element of Catholic education, uh, true formation in the Catholic faith and its intellectual and artistic heritage. I think that's something that a lot of people here, especially in the United States, are interested in. And in looking back on your experience, what do you see as the spiritual fruits of your education that integrated all these things? How did this integration of sacred music, the liturgy, the intellectual tradition of the Catholic faith, help you in your life as a Catholic and in your profession as a musician? That's, that's a, a really important question. I think, I think the exposure to the, to the music does things that we can't actually necessarily uh, put into words very easily. There's something so profound uh, that's going on in some of the, the motets of Palestrina and Victoria and Bird and, and composers of that extraordinary caliber um, that that has to do with the 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 sort of it, it ties directly into the the philosophical principles that underscore our faith and uh, a kind of extraordinary um, way of projecting the Catholic faith that, that mere words can't do and I think exposing boys to that and also when they know what what would fill that void if we weren't uh, doing that with this sort of great music, I think is really, really crucial. If you give boys music of real quality and real calibre, they, they really do appreciate it. They really understand it. And the moment that you start to have that um, that kind of music, uh, make it, it changes the way you judge art. And I think that's that certainly happened with me. And it means that you have kind of no time for anything that is of, of lower lower caliber, lower, lower, um, lower quality. And I think it's, it's probably the same in terms, of, in terms of one's education, what kind of books one reads. Uh, you, you start to get a sense of, of books that are profound and have depth. And I think it's exactly the same thing with music. Um, certainly, I think that's what happened with me. I, 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 it's, it's, it's very hard to say from one's own point of view. But I think that uh, the music, the way that music um, has an effect, I think particularly Gregorian chant as well, is is something that has incalculable value. And uh, I'm really pleased to be able to bring that to these boys. One question I have, Charles, is in addition to the musical formation that you have with the boys, I know you do a lot with integrating aspects of culture history with the music and the Catholic faith as well to integrate all these things so that they can see the picture, uh, the, the bigger picture. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, um, I can. I mean, if you've, I think, Peter, you've been in our song room at the oratory, so you know that I've got the walls mm -hmm. in, uh, covered in uh, Renaissance art. Um, right most of it being uh, Northern Italian Renaissance art and uh, some Spanish art as well. And there's a very big reason for that. I mean, I, I, I personally love art. I've just, just got back from uh, a few days in Venice. And, and while I was there, I, I went to my favorite place for several hours, as I always do, which is the Academia Gallery, um, to, to see some of my favorite um, works of art. And it's, it's always been a passion of mine. And on my first um, sort of major tour with the oratory scholar, uh, which was to Spain. We were going to Madrid and I, I decided that we would uh, take the boys to the Prado. Uh, but I thought I would do something a little bit uh, different. Uh, and I would, in advance, I would single out 10 paintings from the Prado and I would talk to them uh, each week. At the end of one of the rehearsals, I would spend five or 10 minutes um, talking about one of these particular paintings. Uh, so that when we got to the Prado, um, they would see these and they would they would know they would be preloaded with information about about the about this art and they would have seen um, they would have seen it on the wall of their mm -hmm. of their rehearsal room and I was completely 
bowled over by the effect that this actually had on them because when we went to the Prado, um, they were so taken with this art. And we were talking about some of these amazing paintings like the, the Juan de Juan um, Last Supper and um, the Raphael um, Cardinal and all sorts right. of really incredible iconic art. Mm -hmm. And they were so taken with it. And afterwards in the shop, you know, rather than buying all the kind of usual rubbish that boys tend to buy, um, silly key rings and things, they were buying prints and, and large size um, uh, replicas of some of these paintings. And I just, I, I, I was really taken with that because I'd never seen boys of that age react in that way to art. So I've now built that into their whole learning experience. So every mm -hmm. time we go uh, somewhere, we, we go and visit uh, their art gallery. So we've been to the art gallery in Seville. When we were in uh, the United States, um, we, we went both to the Frick and to the Met. Uh, of course, in the Frick, you know, you've got that amazing Holbein painting of Thomas, yeah. right. which, which is just so stunning. And uh, the boys were really taken with that. And the Met, again, has just some some extraordinary works of art. And in D.C., we went to the National Gallery of Art as well. Um, I, I think it's so important. I think also when you see art actually in uh, a sacred space, like, for instance, the Reredos of uh, Toledo Cathedral, what an extraordinary sight that is. And for us to go in and sing in front of that Reredos, we're effectively singing the soundtrack to that art by singing the music that was written in that period when that when those paintings were put up and when those statues were carved, um, we're singing the music that, that goes along with that. And it creates an incredible synthesis, which is just very, very, very powerful indeed. So I, I, I really, um, I play up the art side in a, in a, in a very, very major way. And I, th I think it's so, so important. Yeah, that's great. So uh, this is changing gears just uh, one last time here. Um, <laughs> I have a feeling that a lot of people listening to you are really drawn to what you're saying about the integration of all these arts and the, the intellectual heritage and the, and the um, music in the context of the liturgy and the faith. But they might be thinking, well, I don't have a choir school. So what do you think is the role of sacred music in Catholic education in a non-choir school? What are some of the things that a truly Catholic curriculum should cover in a Catholic school? Um, and what would you say to someone who's um, not training to be a professional musician or who rather is, is uh, directing a program at a Catholic school that, you know, realizes that not everyone coming out of there will be a, a professional musician? Um, what is a strong takeaway from a great um, music program in a Catholic school? Well, I think I think the use of music to evangelize and to, uh, as I said earlier, to, to bring children and, and young adults into proximity of something something great and something that they're not going to encounter in, in the rest of their, their their normal life is so, so important. And they really do respond to it in a very major way. So I would say even if there isn't a good choir program in a school, and I, I know that you know the, the setup that we have at the oratory is, is, is quite difficult to achieve. It's not impossible. I think people are too easily put off. Um, but... It's, it, it does take some setting up. But even when that isn't there, I think uh, that people should be able to hear this music, even if it's just through recordings, just as much as in, in, in art, they are going to be shown uh, the great art of some of these, these sort of um, artists that I've been, been mentioning, Raphael and, and Juan de Juan and so forth. Um, I, think, I think that is really, really important to integrate with, with other things that are kind of getting ne neglected, um, proper philosophy, Aquinas, these sorts of things that have kind of been moved out of the way to make way for for, for lesser uh, lesser things that really don't uh, touch the same depths and don't have lasting implications for people. I think that the uh, that the curriculum. I don't know what it's like in the United States, but the curriculum in in England is 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 really quite lacking in many areas. Uh, and I know that the the teachers in in, in the oratory school uh, do quite a lot of work to to patch up uh, huge glaring gaps that they see. And I think that you do that in a in a good school by having having the right sort of people there and and people engaged in a common goal of of making sure that, as you say, there is a truly Catholic curriculum um, because that is something sadly of a rarity. 
Thank you so much for helping us understand uh, not only the technical way in which you bring about this music education, but the bigger picture of what you do. It's truly extraordinary. Thank you. Well, no, not at all. It's 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 a privilege for me to to to, to do this kind of work every day, and and it's very very nice to talk to you about it. It was great to have you. Thanks so Thank much, you Charles. Both. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed listening to today's episode. I love hearing how Charles is forming the students in his choirs in the church's tradition of sacred music. It is really refreshing and beautiful to see that what the church calls for in her teaching is being put into practice in remarkable ways. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. In the meantime, check out upcoming events on our website. Included on the list, you'll find our upcoming sacred music course offerings at St. Joseph's Seminary in Yonkers, New York this summer. We're offering four courses, and they are available in a hybrid online in-person format for some of them, and others are in a short four- or five-day intensive. These courses during the summer of 2019 will be Teaching Gregorian Chant to Children, which is an introduction to the Ward methodology for teaching children chant, Principles of Sacred Music, which is a history of sacred music, church documents on sacred music, and practical issues. Principles of Chant, which is a sort of 0-60 to 60 course on learning to sing Gregorian chant. And Introduction to the Organ for Pianists. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Peter Carter and Dr. Jennifer Donaldson. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Heck Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole from the CD, Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is the first movement of Trio Sonata No. 6 in G Major by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Peter Carter. We look forward to having you join us next time, and until then, may we sing the praise of His glory. <laughs>